Ooh. Yeah. Hello, YouTubers! My name is Willie. Welcome to my channel. Today I have Reaction Request 83 Non Imperial Titans by Arch Warhammer. Requested by CJ Falcon. So, let's check it out. Alright. Play. That's another Arch Warhammer video. Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet another 40k lore video. This will be the third and final lore video on Titans. In this video, we are going to be looking at non-Imperial Titans, or their equivalent. Now, not all races employ Titans or something equivalent <laughs> to Titans, but we're not going to go through all of that here. I'm not going to go through all of the ways that some of these races counter titans, like for example, just you know getting out of the fucking way, like for example in the case of the Dark well, Nova, yeah. or in the case of the Tau, where they are developed at first some very very stopgap means to countering titans using spaceships essentially, and then later on developing specialized battle suits developed against titans. You uh, will be able to see those suits in the Battle Suits Allure video that I've already made if you are interested. But for the moment, we will move on to perhaps the most untitany titans of them all. The Tyranid Bio-Titans. As one might expect, the Tyranid Bio-Titans are large. Very, very large Tyranid Bio-forms intended to counter... Well, very large things, essentially, <laughs> or to overcome extremely heavily fortified areas where the usual strains of Tyranids might not be enough. These massive strains are, of course, quite varied, and in fact there is no true standard here, but we will be using a few of the more common examples as a de facto standard. There will almost certainly be minor variations, even within the same strain, so as to let the creature adapt to various conditions, like extreme cold or extreme <laughs> heat, etc. But in general, we can divide them into a few subclasses, the most common of which is the Heriophant. This immense and rather um, unattractive creature is the Tyranid equivalent of a wrecking ball, essentially. It is not a subtle weapon, it is not a particularly demanding weapon, it is simply just a very, very large ball of gooey nonsense that the Tyranids will throw straight at whatever they need to get the hell out of nice. the way. They are usually employed in groups of two to three, and can be quite the threat to Imperial Titans. Now, Something along the lines of a warlord or a reaver or anything like that is not going to be too worried about a single hierophant. Three hierophants, on the other hand, quite a different story. And they are, although not exactly a straight up match for a warhound titan in ideal circumstances, if it does manage to close the distance via an ambush, for example, something along those lines, it can most definitively destroy a warhound titan very, very quickly in Wow. Indeed. And while it is somewhat lacking in ranged firepower compared to Imperial Titans, it more than makes up for this with its rather considerable prowess in uh, close quarters combat. <laughs> it is nice. not entirely defenseless when it comes to ranged defenses either, naturally. Being armed with uh, several spore cannons and other exotic turned weaponry, most of which are designed to launch globulates of poison and other such horrible things into the enemy's ranks. Nice. In fact, the elephant is quite keen on uh, its uh, poisonous arsenal and uses a lot of different poison-based weapons, like, for example, poisonous spores, various uh, gaseous attacks, 
and poisoned barbs located on its abdomen to attack unprotected infantry. Essentially, what it will try to do is just flat out charge enemy positions, get in amongst the middle of them, and then start covering everything in vile tyranny goop. Be this acid to melt through uh, heavy fortifications or tanks, or impaling infantry with its hordes of long spiked tentacles, or simply just covering everything in a fog of poisonous spores. Yeah. And then everything <laughs> is too large or you know, too tough to be outright poison, it will simply just smash with its massive claws. Again, it might not be the most sophisticated of weapons, but it certainly is a rather effective Sounds one. Sounds like it. Its primary weakness is, however, also its primary strength. It is very, very large, and it moves relatively fast for something of that size. However, it is not particularly heavily armored. There's really only so much one can achieve with muscle-bound, chitinous kiting and other manners of biological defenses when you get to that size. High explosive artillery shells, for example, will be squishing the vulnerable parts of the Tyranid that would otherwise be protected by Kithner's plating, for example. Yeah. This is, of course, <laughs> a relatively large drawback for these large creatures, as missing them is, um, well, a challenge even for the most incompetent of orc gunners. And seeing as they are also usually employed in groups of two to three, it's very hard to not see these things coming. Now, the Tyranids have gotten around this somewhat by employing defensive swarms. Essentially, they will simply just throw tens of thousands of little ones at the defenses, hoping to exhaust their supply of heavy ordnance before sending in the Hierophants. Because as far as the Tyranid hive mind is concerned, the only thing that matters is breaking the line somewhere. It doesn't really give a yeah. shit about how many units it might have to sacrifice to do so, because, well, it can just return the overwhelming majority of that biomass back to the fleet anyway, so it really, <laughs> really doesn't matter if it has to sacrifice 90% of its little ones as long as the Hierophants gets through and actually manage to break a hole in the defences. The Hierophants have also been known to be deployed directly onto the battlefield from orbit wow. in specialized spore pods capable of carrying the rather considerable bulk of Hierophant down to the planet's surface safely through the atmosphere and then delivering it into the battlefield without having it squished by the fact that it just got dropped from orbit. <laughs> However, Squash. Well, just look at the thing. It's going to require a very large spore pod and it's going to be lighting up on every single radar installment pretty much everywhere on the planet, and it's going to be attracting a lot of spanking on its way down. So it is usually only uh, applied like this, or deployed like this, maybe correct, in extremely favorable circumstances where the planet's orbital defenses have already been suppressed to such an extent that they do no longer pose a credible threat nice. against the Hierophant's nice. drop pod, or uh, spore pod, more to be more precise. But, of course, this is not the only biotitan employed by the Tyranids. Okay. They also employ a flying variant by the name of the Haridon. The Haridon could be considered almost a kind of an flying aircraft carrier of sorts, except it is also... Fleshy. A rather offensive weapon. It is not merely there for support, it's also more than capable of strafing ground targets with its bio cannon, its claws, or its massive jaws. Nice. Now, the reason why I call it an aircraft carrier of sorts is because it acts as a kind of a support point for the smaller gargoyles, which you can see flying around it on this uh, like we're playing here. They are capable of using the Harrison as kind of a rearming and resupply platform, except not in the uh, traditional <laughs> sense. They don't go back to the Harrison to take on fuel, they go back to the Harrison to take on more biomatter, should they require extra ammunition for their various bioweapons, yeah. or if they should be required to travel large that distances. That is interesting. The Gargoyles are usually deployed in battle with a very finite 
fuel gauge, so to say. Their hyperbolic metabolism burns through their available energy extremely quickly, which means that if they are expected to carry out a long-term fight, which is very rare, the Tyranid uh, hive mind is not a fan of grueling attrition combat over the course of many, many days with the same units, it much prefers just throwing shit at the wall until the wall and the shit <laughs> and everything is just an irrecognizable goop of nonsense nice. that have uh, boiled down into a wonderful food-friendly substance that the Rippers can then go and nom all over. But dub, 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 occasionally, dub. <laughs> it is necessary for the Tyranids to deploy their troops a long distance away from the target. For example, if the orbital defenses over the target are simply just too strong for the Tyranid bio fleets to take a direct approach on the target and the deploy the troops the heck nearby. Heck In this case, if the gargoyles had to fly all the way to the target on their own energy, nice. a lot of them were simply going to die before they get there, which the Tyranid hive mind, of course, would be considering somewhat wasteful as such. It invented these giant support creatures essentially to ferry large amounts of troops. They have also developed dedicated transport creatures, but I'll be getting to that in the Tyranid video because they are not considered bio-titans. Now, technically, the Haridans also can be considered bio-titans and they can also be not considered bio-titans because they vary in size to a rather considerable degree and the Megos biologist is a little bit confused as to why. Specimens have been noted to be upwards of 30 meters in length, with a wind span of up to 40 meters, but they've also been noticed to be about the size of a gargoyle, and there's no real reason that has been found for these discrepancies as of yet. Perhaps the smaller ones are simply just encountered um, to be heavy support platforms carrying slightly heavy well, it does the build ones, creatures example. as needed and perhaps the smaller ones need time to grow into the larger ones it's hard to say really so anyone's so maybe smaller ones this one are just, just adapted for that then we have the dactylis this lovely fluffy little creature is essentially a super heavy turn and artillery piece firing extra large clubs of spore mines at extreme range. Nice. Their four limbs, it's as you can see here, are very, very large. A and cannon thing. anchor it to the planet's surface, <laughs> and also they are used as virtually shields, essentially. Now, the Dactylus is not a frontline artillery piece, unlike the smaller Biovore, but nevertheless, it does have a nasty habit of getting into direct engagements, as the enemy tend to consider these to be very high priority targets, as of course getting bombarded by spore mines is not something that most racers consider to be pleasant. <laughs> and as such, they usually adopt an extremely racist standpoint towards the uh, Dectilises and try to wipe them off the map as quickly as humanly possible. And, uh, well, this is a fairly good stance to take considering its ammunition. Now, I figured I'd actually tell you exactly what spore mines are here, since I haven't gotten to the Tyranid video yet, and you can't be expected to know precisely what they are. So, a spore mine is essentially a living artillery shell, I guess. It is often used as mines, and is also used in orbital uh, fighting as ordnance. It explodes if any non tyranid life form gets too close to one. And they generally come in three variants poison, fragmentation, and bioacid, doing pretty much exactly what is on the packages there. <laughs> the poison spore mine is full of toxics, gas, viruses, bacteria, poison, etc. And essentially, its internal organs, there, which creates all of these poisons, are also covered with small fragmentation rounds, essentially. Nice. <laughs> pieces of bone and cartilage, so that when they explode, they become living fragmentation rounds, essentially. The Frank spore mine has an iron hard outer shell instead of this bone and cartilage, giving it more of a fragmentation effect, but it's somewhat lighter on the poisons, and the bioacid spore mine, well, 
It is a giant vat of bioacid that explodes outwards, covering everything in a considerable area. And bioacid, very, very, very uncomfortable indeed. Yeah. It is more than capable of eating through the hulls of armored vehicles. And, well, you can imagine what happens if this actually gets in contact with living tissue. <laughs> oh, yes, not comfortable at all. Not comfortable in the slightest. Yeah. Now, these four mines do have a rudimentary intelligence. Not only are they capable of recognizing tyranids from you know, other life forms and therefore choosing when to detonate, but they're also capable of floating through the air for days, months, or even years in some cases, until they find something suitable to go boom at. Whether or not they eat while they do this is unclear. How they... Um, keep themselves fed is not entirely clear so we don't know if they are capable of you know floating around for years completely unsupported or if they somehow draw nourishment from the air around themselves they are relatively large creatures considering the fact that they are capable of living off a year without you know obviously taking in sustenance but they're also extremely simple creatures and you gotta remember, in most cases, what requires the most energy in a living human is the brain. And the brain of the small mine is exceedingly simple. It is essentially just an on-off switch the case. that keeps continuously scanning the nearby area through rudimentary sensor inputs going, well, there is no non-tyranid bio-life forms nearby, so I'm not going to explode until it runs into something that isn't a tyranid, in which case it goes, oh, well, this isn't a tyranid, time for me to go back. So it might not require all that much energy to be with what it should either, have. but, uh, well, fantasy universe, so we might just have to go with that excuse here. As for how this is created inside the tyranid, uh, by a war, in this case the Dactylus, well, they're birthed. Quite literally, the Dactylus gives birth to these things and then expels them through this giant cannon that is um, fused to its body. You could essentially compare it to a very large anus. It contracts and it fires the living spore mines out so that they can find something to go boom on. It is perhaps not the, um, most elegant <laughs> weapons ever invented by the hive mind, but then again, this is a race of creatures that fires their young at the enemy pretty much all the time. Well, it's just so, going to dissolve um, them in the end. It is technically a massive baby cannon that fires exploding babies, bear you in mind. But hey, each to their own, right? And then lastly, this one is not technically a bio titan, but I feel that somewhat deserves the designation because of its value okay, on the battlefield. Okay, what's that? The Dominatrix. Yes, wonderful name there. And this one does not fire its babies at the enemy, so it's nice like that. This is primarily a command and control center. Living, breathing, presumably shitting and pissing, command center. Huh. It is an extremely powerful psyker that is used as a relay node to relay the orders from the hive mind directly into nearby Tyranid units. Nice. And it is considerably better at this than the usual leaders of the Tyranid swarms, things like um, hive lords, that kind of stuff. However, they're also very, very vulnerable. They are essentially just a massive armored brain. They are capable of imparting extremely complex tactical planning and decision making into even the smallest of Tyranid life forms, but it is also extremely simple to detect for any enemy psychers, which makes it an extremely high value target. As if you kill a Tyranid uh, Broodlord, for example, you're going to be throwing the local swarm into disarray. <laughs> you're probably going to be taking away the command and control network for an area of a couple dozen kilometers, perhaps. Perhaps, if you're lucky, a couple hundred kilometers, depending on the um, you know, density of command nodes. However, if you were to take out a dominatrix, in all due likelihood, you would be removing the command and control center for pretty much every single turn on the planet. The nice. psychic backlash alone from the dominatrix's death it would, in all due likelihood, incapacitate the overwhelming majority of other command and control creatures on the planet. Interesting. However, killing a dominatrix is no easy task. 
they are quite large, quite angry, and more than capable of defending themselves with a varied arsenal of bioweaponry. They usually employ some form of venom cannon, or some form of light artillery, and their armament can usually be likened to that of a super heavy imperial tank. <laughs> Naturally, they are also extremely psychic beings, which means they also have the ability to use psychic attacks, like, for example, a warp blast, which essentially tears a minuscule hole in reality with predictable consequences. Now, additionally, the Dominatrixes also have a very interesting special rule. In most cases, they are simply there to extend the will of the Hive Mind, but in a handful of cases, they have been known to carry Tyranid Norn Queens on their backs or inside their bodies directly into battle. Now, the Norn Queens are essentially the um, highest command echelon of the Tyranid army, and as such, this is equal to having an Imperial Guard's, you know, force commander and his highest military uh, authority on the planet itself in a super heavy tank. However, the thing is also, of course, the psychic backlash again. Killing a dominatrix would, like I said, result in a rather considerable psychic backlash would be... It would be crippling to the tyrant efforts on the planets, but should it be carrying a Norn queen and said queen also perish, the potential psychic backlash could be so devastating that it could be felt in all <laughs> It could literally be the end of the entire Tyranid Hive fleet. Nice. As the entire fleet, of course, then reverts to animalistic behavior, preying upon each other, crashing into each other, infighting, all manners of stuff. So it is quite rare. It is only really done, usually, if there are multiple known queens, so that if one should perish, well, the consequences would still be dire, but the other ones would be able to re-establish the command and control network. Nice, and nice. So. And having a known queen in battle also brings with it one further, even bigger problem. You see, if the known queen should be captured alive, this is the worst possible scenario for the Tyranids, as the known queen carries within her the unmutated strain of the Tyranids, of that particular Tyranid Hive fleet at the very least, which means that this pure genetic strain can be used to develop neurotoxins that specifically target this strain of Tyranid. Wow. Which means that even if the Tyranids continue to mutate after this point, the pure strain will still be effective against them. Yeah. Which essentially means that if an Orgwin is captured, the Imperium will be able to develop a neurotoxin capable of destroying this particular brand of Tyranid pretty much forever. <laughs> the entire Hive fleet will at that point be vulnerable to this neurotoxin. And you gotta remember, Tyranid Hive fleets like of this can be massive things. They do not necessarily have to be a single fleet, it could be an entire tendril of the Tyranid um, Hive Fleet itself. It could literally be an entire Tyranid invasion, all of which could be brought low by the loss of a single known queen. Wow. As such, they are very, very rarely seen in battle like this. But occasionally, the Tyranids do get a little bit overconfident, and in fact, a capture of such a non-queen has in fact occurred when one of them was captured by an ultramarine contingent during the invasion of Ultramar by the high fleet behemoth. That is... And uh, one last thing that needs to be mentioned about the known queens. Should the Tyranid fleet survive the psychic backlash, e.g. it has known queens in backup, if one were to be killed, it will cause all the Tyranid ships capable of producing Norn Queens to calve more Norn Queens. This is essentially a survival mechanism, whereas if the fleet loses one of its very precious queens, they will then immediately begin producing as many new queens as possible 
and they will then try and create new splinter fleets to send these queens out in. Nice. Essentially, this is the Hive Fleet's reaction to going, well, something very, very dangerous is here because it actually managed to kill a queen, one of the heaviest protected uh, members of our fleet. Therefore, the logical conclusion is birth a ton more of them and then try to send them out into the wider galaxy on their own to spread and grow and, of course, then weaken the enemy further and to avoid this particular enemy who's really, really dangerous because it just killed the non queen. Bad. A pretty damn little ingenious bit of uh, survival tactic there by the Tyranids. And lastly, I'd like to talk about the Trigon. Now, yes, I know this isn't technically a bio titan, but look at it. It is adorable and it deserves to be here. The Trigon is a special species of Ravenna very large species of Ravenna, usually used for infiltration purposes as well as shock assault. Nice. This massive cuddly creature burrows through the ground using its very, very large claws to create massive underground tunnels through which large bodies of Tyranids can that move. That is a fantastic piece of art there. And the Trigon is a very, very good digger. In fact, the Trigon is capable of excavating tunnels large enough to carry hundreds, if not thousands, of Tyranids over the span of days. In fact, it is even such a remarkably good digger that it can burrow its way through considerable layers of concrete. It has been known to infiltrate bunker complexes simply just by burrowing up through the floor nice. and disgorging armies nice. of Raveners or Gaunts or Hormagons, etc. Additionally, of course, having very, very large claws, it is far from defenseless in close quarter combat. Its uh, sinuous body is quite powerful and capable of propelling it at considerable speeds, which essentially turns it into a very large, very nipply battering ram. And additionally, <laughs> somewhat uniquely to its type of creature, it has a very strong link to the hive mind. In most cases, these kinds of infiltration and shock assault creatures have a fairly weak connection to the hive mind, relying on other synaptic creatures around them to guide their efforts. But the Trigon is different. It is capable of commanding relatively large contingents of Tyranids, which allows it to roam very independently on the battlefield, setting nice. up its own ambushes, etc., and then coming in to help the larger forces of the Tyranids by attacking enemy rear lines, burrowing into bunker complexes, attacking command and control centers, that kind of stuff. In fact, some Tyranid Trigons have been rumored to have developed specialized antennas capable of picking up radio traffic, which it will then use to home in on the area with the most radio traffic in it, and then appearing for some sudden violent surprise. But, <laughs> but enough about the Gribblies, let's move on to the Eldar Titans. Now, there are quite a few more varieties than what I'll be listing here, but in general, there is the Revenant Scout Titan, the Phantom Titan, and the Warlock Titan. Now, the Revenant Scout Titan is, as the name suggests, a rough equal to the Imperial Warhound Titan. Nice. It is the smallest grade Eldar Titan. All other Titans are extremely agile and graceful constructs, far more so than their Imperial uh, counterparts, but the Revenant compact size allows it a degree of uh, movement and, uh, well, agility that Imperial Titans can only dream <laughs> of. The disparity in mobility and agility is further enhanced by the simple fact that the Revenant does not rely entirely upon its legs for locomotion. It is equipped with several jetpacks and anti-grav systems, which allows them to leap oh. and to glide across the landscape well, that's cool. in a way that is simply incomparable to the cumbersome and lumbering footfalls of the Imperial Titans. This, of course, gives the Eldar uh, Revenant Scout Titan a massive advantage when it comes to traversing heavy terrain, be they rocky mountainsides or areas with tons of crevasses or, you know, even just on the sides of mountains. The Revenant is capable of traversing areas that most Imperial Titans simply would not be able to traverse 
even with the aid of various mechanics, elements like bridge builders, etc., as a gorge that would simply be too long to be spanned, even by uh, Imperial bridge building technology, a revenant could simply just jump that gorge. So, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> damn effective when it comes to maneuvering over wide and broken terrain. Despite this almost ethereal grace, however, Revenant Titans are extremely well-armed, if not quite so well-armoured. Their agility, of course, and their ability to uh, get across pretty much anywhere allows them to get into extremely advantageous positions and also allows them to harry enemy lines like quick-moving scouts, and they can also then bring to bear their considerable weaponry. Most Eldar Titans carry... Titan killing class weapons. Nice. Most of them are highly precise, very low fire rate, extremely high impact weaponry, lance weaponry, for example, that creates pinpricks of extremely concentrated lasers. Now, technically, Imperial Lance technology is also lasers, but comparing the two is like comparing the Wright Brothers flying machine to a jumbo jet. Eldar <laughs> Brightlands technology is so immeasurably superior to Imperial technology that it's not even funny. It's practically magical at this point, and it is capable of punching through pretty much anything nice. that the Imperium can put against it. Void shields do offer relatively substantial protection against these weapons, but when it comes to armor plating, there is simply no armor plating heavy enough to survive a direct hit by pretty much any of the Eldar Titan-based weapons. Wow. And when it comes to weapons, the Eldar do have a rather considerable arsenal. However, unlike Imperial Titans, they usually stick with single configurations and specialize themselves within their chosen field. For example, while the Imperial Titan could change between an anti-infantry to an anti-tank loadout, in most cases, Elder Titans will stick with one or the other regardless of the situation, yes. and they are rather expected to be employed in situations where their specific loadout will come to the greatest effect. Now, this is a weakness for Eldar Titans, simply because if they have a set amount of Titans in a campaign, for example, they will not be able to simply just switch out the weapons. However, this also means that the Eldar Titan crews are extremely familiar with their chosen weapon configuration, and are therefore pretty damn good at using them. Additionally, Eldar Titans usually have very, very small crews. In fact, in most cases, they only have a gunner and a pilot. Wow. In some cases, they don't even have that many, which means that uh, there is a hell of a lot more of a consensus among its crew, obviously enough. While in an Imperial Titan, in many cases, the Principe is going to have to give an order, for example, to fire the weapons to the weapons moderati, or take control directly off the weapon from the moderati, a process that might only take a few seconds, but seconds nonetheless yeah. that you might not be able to spare on the battlefield. In Eldar Titans, this is usually far less of an issue, seeing as in most cases, even if there are multiple crew members, these crew members are psychically linked in a way that humans are just flat out not capable of. <laughs> in most cases, they are in fact twins, or even triplets, that have developed their bonds over millennia to the point where they are now capable pretty much of predicting each other's thoughts and behaviours before they even occur, which allows the crew to work together almost as a single entity, which gives them a considerable advantage over Imperial Titans when it comes to reaction speed. Nice. And in the case of the smaller Titans, like the Revenant, there is often only one crew member, but the siblings will command several Revenants. For example, triplets would command a small pack of three Revenants, and uh, brothers would command two revenants, or sisters for that matter. The Eldar are not particularly uh, discriminatory when it comes to this stuff. In fact, in Eldar society, birth is a very, very, very rare thing indeed, and it's always celebrated, but the birth of twins 
or triplets is seen as something truly special and generally speaking nice. the triplets or the uh, twins are usually considered to be a sign from their gods they are usually considered to be bound for great things and commanding wow. a titan well that is a pretty damn great thing, is it not? <laughs> in fact, it goes to the point that Walk if, if one of the siblings were to die, in most cases his spirit stone, with its uh, soul uh, trapped inside of it, will be incorporated into the living siblings, uh, Titan, and they will then make up essentially a crew of two, where the wow. soul of the dead sibling will be able to commune with the living sibling. In most cases, this is a somewhat somber event, however, as the living sibling will very rarely leave the Titan ever again, preferring instead to remain within it and commune with his dead siblings. Huh. Tragic as this may be, it does, however, give the Eldar access to an extremely experienced core of Titan pilots, with experiences switching back into the centuries and sometimes even the, the millennia combined this with the extreme maneuverability and rapid reactions of an Eldar Titan along with their devastating weaponry and you have a pretty goddamn solid <laughs> fighting machine at your hands and of course the revenants are the smallest the phantom titans are considerably larger although they still maintain their slender build they are capable of carrying along with them considerably more boom, which is always advantageous, with lance weapons, of course, capable of punching through uh, even the heaviest of armor, along with rapid-firing laser weapons capable of shredding entire regiments of standard. Nice. But, of course, all the weaponry in the world might not necessarily do the job unless there is also some defenses in place. Now, Elder Titans do not use void shields or force shields or any kind of physical protection along these lines, but they do use something called a hollow field emitter. The bigger the Titan, generally speaking, the more and more powerful such emitters it possesses. This. These hollow fields do well, pretty much exactly what is on the tin. It creates a holographic projection of the Titan that is moved slightly off-center, or even just moved dozens, if not hundreds of meters off-center in various stages of holographic uh, well, stability. Essentially, there will be dozens of holographic images all looking like the Titan, and all of them giving off pretty much the same readings on a radar scope. Wow. Which means it's pretty damn hard to actually hit and Elder Titan, since you can never be entirely sure which one is the It would real also one. make it hard to figure out how Some many Elder there Titans are. Have also been reported to be in possession of hollow fields capable of creating illusions in areas where in which the Titans is not even present while hiding itself behind a chameleon cloak. Essentially what this means is it would present a single holographic target to an enemy Titan while hiding itself behind a cloak of invisibility almost, behind a holographic field that reflects the landscape around it. Wait until the Titan has fired its weaponry at the fake and then appear and discharge its own weaponry. Nice. Now, Elder Titans are capable of firing their weapons while cloaked. However, the moment they fire their weapons, the holographic effect lessens considerably, oh. and it's a hell of a lot easier to tell which one is the correct one. Still not perhaps easy, but a hell of a lot easier, so some care has to be taken when the weapons are discharged. Additionally, if the weapons are fired for a long enough period of time, it becomes very easy to tell which one is the right one, as only one of them will continuously be producing heat, rather than the uh, phantoms, who will only be mimicking the heat signature of a uh, normal at-rest type. Oh. And, nice. of course, the hollow field provides precisely zero protection against actually getting hit. <laughs> If you're hit, the whole field is going to do precisely dick. Which means that Elba Titans can be quite vulnerable, even to relatively light anti-vehicle weapons. Oh. Even something as presumably weak as Imperial Laz guns mounted on things like battle tanks 
can cause significant damage to Eldar Titans, presuming, of course, first of all, that they can hit them, despite the fact that they are very, very quick maneuverable, and that they can guess which one is the correct one behind the hollow field. But if they're capable of hitting them, significant damage can be done if something like a joint, for example, is hit. But Eldar Titans do not necessarily have to rely on mundane weaponry. There is a class of Phantom Titans, known as Warlock Titans. Oh. These Titans do not contain a living pilot at all. Rather, it contains within its wraithbone core the spirit of a mighty Eldar Farseer, or Warlock. As they were powerful psychics in life, so too are they in deaths, and they are capable of using their vast psychic powers as weapons, in addition <laughs> to the already considerable armaments already present on board the Phantom Titan. Additionally, the very construction of the Titan, its a wraithbone construct, amplifies the dead psychic's powers to considerable levels, nice. to the point where he's not only capable of fighting for long periods of time using his psychic powers, he's also capable of using his precognitive powers to a much greater degree. Huh. This allows him to amplify his already considerable defensive powers through the hollow field by the simple application of knowing where the enemy fire is going to be heading, and then simply just moving out of the way. Nice. Now, as you can imagine, it's already pretty damn hard to hit such a titan, and when additionally the titan knows when it is going to be hit and is capable of taking evasive maneuvers to avoid getting hit, it becomes a task of rather Herculean proportions to actually hit one of these things. In fact, in most tricky. cases, simply just hitting it with a single weapon is futile. Taking down a Warlock Titan requires the application of considerable overkill, preferably the firepower of entire regiments aimed against, well, the, again, the, the general location, really, of such a Titan, and then hoping for the best. <laughs> Additionally, of course, the Titan possesses considerable weaponry in just in its phantom form, it also now has the ability, of course, of turning its enemies' minds inside out, Ooh. which can be a rather effective deterrence, I'm sure you will agree. Yeah. And while Imperial Void Shields do offer some protection against psychic attacks, it is still probably one of the best ways of countering a Titan, just ignoring the Titan entirely and just pulping the mind of whoever controls it. Additionally, there are a few smaller variants like the, um, the Wraith Knights and just the Eldar Knights, but I won't be talking about them here, since I would consider those to be closer to Imperial Knights rather than full-on Titans. I'll probably do a video on uh, Knights at some point, and I might uh, cover them there, but for the moment, let's move on to the Orc Titans, the so-called uh, Gargans. Oh. The word Gargant is essentially used as a blanket term for Orc Titans. There are quite a few variations. Uh, stompers, Super Stompers, uh, Gargants, Mechboy Gargants, Great Gargants, Mega Gargants, etc, etc. Usually this is the Orc designation, as the Orcs just prefer designating things by saying, well, this one is larger than the other one, the first one is a Great Gargant, so... That obviously makes the other one a Mega Gargant. An ultimate Gargant. Uh... Mega Gargant would be a Super Duper Gargant, etc. Rather simplistic naming, but certainly effective. It's like the Titan smallest Maximum. of these um, Titan Titans, quote unquote, Mega is Bob. the Stomper. <laughs> the Stomper is usually produced when an aspiring warlord simply cannot find enough shit to cobble together a Gargant and is used as a bit of a stopgap measure without a clearly defined role. It is usually equipped with some form of close combat weapon along with uh, one or two ranged weapons and whatever missiles or flak weapons or even just infantry weapons that the orcs can find huh. and bolt onto it. It is also quite often used as a sort of an assault transport as it usually has enough armor to or wander into enemy defences, and then unleash large numbers of angry greenskin upon <laughs> a thoroughly suspecting defender. This is by no means a sneaky weapon. It is uh, rather hard to miss, 
as of course its name, Stomper, is uh, quite accurate. It makes a fair bit of noise as it moves forward on its uh, less than ideally lubricated legs. Nice. Interestingly enough, however, while most other races' titans are just titans, and they will remain the same class of titans throughout their entire livelihood, and in some cases they will change weapons, but in many cases they will even stay with the normal weapon configuration simply because the titan has taken a liking to them. The Stompers could not be more different. Stompers will change out their weaponry frequently. Essentially, if the warboss comes across something that appears to be larger and more effective, or hell, just makes more noise, it is far from uncommon for him to simply switch out the weapons. Additionally, nice. Stompers continuously grow throughout their lifespans as its crews keeps bolting random nonsense to it. Occasionally, this might be something useful, like extra gun turrets, and occasionally it might be something remarkably unuseful, like, for example, extra toilets, or perhaps just some really, really big horns on the side. <laughs> or perhaps even just they will just stample random pieces of sheet metal to its sides, because they figured that they made funny shapes. Nice. It is far too uncommon to see Stompers adorned with massive dingly penises simply because the goblin crew decided it looked damn amusing. Although it should wow. be mentioned that even the lowliest, the filthiest, the dirtiest of goblins would never go so far as to watch a certain Michael Bay robot movie for inspiration. That shit was fucking heretical, and even the orcs recognize that fucking nonsense as being one step too fucking far. <laughs> as for their okay. battlefield use, <laughs> stompers are usually, if they are expected to be effective, employed in so-called stomper mobs, where dozens of these angry creatures will be gathered together and used essentially like a mailed fist. They are by orc standards, very heavy and relatively reliable transports with a decent amount of more or less reliable firepower, and are then used to deliver large amounts of angry orcs into the enemy's defenses with relative safety. However, seeing as most stompers are usually commanded by a war boss, it often is just a little bit challenging to have dozens of war bosses, each with their own brilliant battle plans, to cooperate for any amount of time oh. to, you know, organize a stomper mob. In most cases, the organization of a stomper mob requires a far larger war boss who will already have beaten the shit out of the war bosses commanding the stompers. The problem is that, of course, all war bosses have a fairly short memory. As such, the whole procedure of beating the crap out of them will have to be repeated very, very frequently. Wow. And this whole beating the shit out of the <laughs> process is somewhat complicated by the fact that they are in possession of a stomper. Alternatively, of course, a prospective war boss can bring his lesser war bosses in lines simply by possessing a larger gargant. Usually, this will begin as a gargant. Now, a gargant is the largest of land-based orc fighting machine, although there are larger variants of gargants again, and is usually built as a start sign, so to say, for an orc warg. Once an orc warboss has grown sufficiently in power, he will usually begin the construction of a gargant, and the gargant will then become the uh, physical manifestation of the warg. It will be the warg's primary banner, almost. <laughs> a um, very, very large flag, you could perhaps call it, around which all of the other orcs can rally. Alternatively, it could be the blunt object that the orc warboss uses to bash the other orcs over the head nice. in case they are misbehaving. And usually, it is a mix of the two. <laughs> and while they might look somewhat, um, slapdash, they are rather effective fighting vehicles. They might not be particularly elegant, and they might not quite embody the devastating potential of Imperial Titans, but they do, however, have one thing in abundance. 
In the immortal words of the orc boss mech bad luck of one leg, it's gonna be dead shooty with loads of guns all over. <laughs> <laughs> so generally wow. speaking, <laughs> it has a lot of firepower. It might not be very accurate firepower, and hell, it might not even be very reliable firepower, but it's going to have a lot of it, and well, there is, after all, that whole saying about modern walls. Now, granted, orc engineering sometimes is a little lacking when it comes to accuracy, and orc gunnery can also be less than <laughs> ideally ranged on target. However, again, with enough guns that fire quickly enough, then it isn't really that big of a problem, and honestly, in most cases, Orc guns are not there so much to kill the enemy as it is to convince him to keep his fucking head down for long enough for the orcs to get within bashy bashy range. Nice. Which is also usually why the orc guardians carry some form of massive melee weapon. Be this just simply a gigantic metal cudgel, a giant ass chainsaw, <laughs> or some kind of massive claw. It doesn't really matter, it is still several dozens tons of metal smashing into a target at considerable speed. It doesn't necessarily require to be a mastercrafted power glaive for that to have an effect on targets. Wow, look at that. And so, of course, in the pursuit like the of the <laughs> goal of pumping the largest volume of lead possible downrange, the Gargans usually carry more guns for its size than Imperial Titans. Nice. Most Gargans will have two to three Titan Killer class weapons and one or two heavier weapons mounted in its midsections. This penis cannon or belly cannon or gut buster or many, many other wonderful things, <laughs> including the so-called snapper melee weapon, a particularly cruel invention that fires out of the Gargant's uh, pants section, grabbing a hold of his enemies and then pulling it into its crotch, <laughs> whereupon it can be abused at the Gargant's leisure. Well. Bear in mind, though, that there is practically nothing that could be considered a standard Gargant. Pretty much every single one of them is built differently, with different weapons, different size, different specifications, different nice. power outputs, different top speed, different size, etc, etc. As Gargans are not built from a blueprint or anything, they are essentially just created out of the inspiration that hits the uh, local orc big mech. Nice. Essentially, you could kind of consider them to be a manifestation of the orc wag. Essentially, if enough wag power is located in any given area, the knowledge and the well, want to create a gargant or a stomper or a super gargant, etc., will just kind of fall into the head of whatever orc mech boy is nearest that has the most resources than capable, perhaps, of banging one together. Nice. This does not necessarily mean that he will succeed in hammering one together, but it will certainly increase his chances quite considerably. However, again, they will continuously build on their work, so a Gargant need necessarily never stop growing. This. A Stomper can turn into a Gargant, a Gargant can turn into a Great Gargant, a Great Gargant can turn into a Mega Gargant. <laughs> it all depends on how much random nonsense that the Orc Megaboy finds to hammer onto it, and of course it depends on the Gargant actually surviving its, uh, its supposed purpose, which, like I've talked about uh, previously, is mostly as a super heavy assault platform, which means it is going to attract a fair bit of, uh, well, attention from the enemy's heavy gun emplacements. Yeah, but understandably. Of course, sometimes a normal gargant is simply not enough, in which case an orc warboss will endeavor to build himself a great gargant who sports a hell of a lot more boom, a hell of a lot more bang, and a hell of a lot more custom force fields for defenses. Usually, these gargants can be reckoned on to have roughly twice the firepower of their normal gargant brethren. This usually takes the form of some 
rather dodgy twin linking, which usually yes. consists of taking one super death gun and linking it to another super death gun by a lot of chains and a lot of duct tape. It might not oh. be the solidest of weapon arrangements, but as long as it goes boom, the orc robot driving the Great Gargant doesn't really give too much of a shit. However, I mentioned custom force fields, and I should probably expand upon that. Custom force fields is something somewhat akin to Imperial Void Shield technology, just yes. not quite as sophisticated. Whereas uh, Void Shield technology essentially takes the energy from the attack and disperses it, Orc Force Fields is more like a solid force. It creates a physical object, nice. almost, that not so much disperses incoming energy as simply just overcomes it with a greater energy. Look at that. This relatively crude solution has its advantages in that they are simpler to produce than full-on void shields and are also usually smaller, but they are also a hell of a lot less reliable, and generally speaking, like if an fortress. orc force field is overloaded, it cannot be repaired, the same as an imperial void shield. Like I mentioned in the other videos, in most cases, if an imperial void shield is overloaded, it can usually be brought back online with the relatively simple act of switching out the fuses. When an orc force field gets overloaded, it usually ends up with the force field exploding rather violently wow. and being put well beyond the means of an orc to repair it without a very, very great amount of time and a lot of forgot slaves. Additionally, the force fields have a slight tendency to violently explode <laughs> even without external influence. Nice. They are usually, after all, constructed by orc mechs with somewhat limited resources, often having a nasty habit of venting large amounts of potentially hazardous energy into the engine compartment into which they are built with uh, somewhat predictable consequences. However, assuming the force field does not gut its own gargant from the inside out, it is a pretty damn reliable form of defense. In fact, it even has a little bit of a sophisticated side to it. You see, it will stop high-energy objects that might potentially hurt the gargants, but it will allow low-energy objects to pass right through it, trusting instead to the gargants' uh, heavy armor to absorb the hit. This actually does allow the force fields to be, relatively speaking, as effective as Imperial Void Shields, while not being as powerful or as reliable. So, uh, nice. whether or not this was by design or pure good old-fashioned accident is not entirely clear, but hey, if it works, don't you dare question it. <laughs> And then, lastly, of course, carrying even more custom force fields and even more guns, there Try is it. the Mega Gargant. Mega Gargants usually carry so many guns that at that point it's kind of getting hard to uh, accurately judge just now and how many it is carrying. Usually half a dozen or so in the chest is a given, and then one or two per arm, and then usually a couple extra guns in extra arms that have been bolted to the Gargant, in addition to dozens of smaller weapons scattered across the Gargant's chassis, its legs, its arms, its heads, literally wherever you can think of to mount a Nice. <laughs> it also usually carries large banks of uh, somewhat haphazardly placed missiles. Often these are smart missiles, piloted by goblins who have long since accepted that, you know what, living a long and fulfilling life seems a hell of a lot more boring than strapping myself to a massive nuclear missile and then heading in the general direction of the enemy. Nice. 
And while Mega Gargans might not look as physically impressive as an Imperial uh, Emperor class Titan, for example, nor is it as large as one of those monstrous machines, it more than makes up for this again with just sheer good old fashioned weight of firepower. <laughs> If you've got enough guns strapped to something, you've got enough guns to deal with something. Now, however, there is one slight drawback, though. You see, while Imperial Titans use mine impulse lynxes, and Eldar Titans literally just commune with the spirits of their war machines, the Orcs use a somewhat more, um, low-tech solution. The Orc Warboss in command of the Gargant has a series of tubes in front of him, which he uses as communication apparatus to communicate with the rest of his crew. These tubes are used to relay the extremely loud bellowing of the warlord in question to the crew as loudly and as clearly as possible. Nice. Now, in most cases, this somewhat haphazardous communication device is only able to deliver the most rudimentary of messages, and even then, more than half of the time, they're going to be getting the messages wrong. However, as long as there is something in the general direction of where the weapons are pointed, the orders can usually be interpreted relatively simply to walk in that general direction, <laughs> because there are things that scream over there, or fire the gun in that general direction, because, again, there are things over there that look like they might be squishy. This somewhat haphazardous <laughs> of communications somewhat impact upon a Gargan's capabilities for tactical and strategic maneuvering on the battlefield. However, again, if you simply just have a dozen guns and you're firing each of these guns in each its direction, odds are that you will eventually be hitting whatever you were supposed to be hitting in the first place, so <laughs> most Orc Borbosses doesn't really take this problem too seriously. In general, if they find themselves missing their intended target too often, they will simply solve this by strapping more guns onto their favorite means of transport. And besides, even if the Orcs had a completely flawless means of communicating with each other across the uh, rather considerable expenses of the Gargant, even that communication system would be frequently compromised by the fact that the so-called captain often leaves his vehicle to go bash things personally, so it doesn't really matter too much, does it? Well... And lastly, before wrapping up the video, I need to be mentioning one specific Orc Gargant weapon, usually mounted only on the heaviest of Gargants, more due to its religious significance rather than its power consumption. The Gaze of Mork. This thing is essentially a very, very, very large zap gun, alternatively often refers to as a massive fuck-off laser. <laughs> The Zap Gun is a magnificent weapon, because on one hand, it can be capable of melting a Bane Blade into sludge with its first firing, or it can hit an Imperial Guardsman head-on and only lightly tickle his privates. The weapon is ever so slightly uh, unpredictable, however, this is not really that much of an issue to the Orcs operating it. As for them, the gaze of Mork holds considerable religious significance. Essentially, if they fire the gaze of Mork and it evaporates the enemy, then that was a bad enemy, and it deserved to be evaporated. If they <laughs> fire this at a other enemy, or just a bunch of friendlies in case they wish to test the weapon, and the target lives, then clearly that is a good target, and Gork and Mork has decided to spare their lives. Nice. This is the exact same way how Orcs distinguish between friendlies and enemies in a confusing battlefield situation. If you fire upon someone and you miss, then he is a friendly. If you fire upon someone, hit and kill him, that was clearly an enemy. Ah, oh, jeez. So, 
On that high note, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for Thank watching. You, Arch. And I do hope to see you soon. Have a good day. Again, a lovely informational video from Arch Warhammer. If you want to check him out, uh, there is a link in the description right down there. Somewhere down there. And so, go check him out if you aren't already watching him. And uh, give him your support. Uh, this video was requested by... CJ Falcon, thank you for requesting it. Quite entertaining. Um, that's pretty much what I got to say about that. So, uh, Willie, out. If you like the video, stay tuned for more content. And as always, feel free to comment. Have a good one.